Hugh, your grace. Before we begin to understand who or what exactly the dragon seeds were, let's go back into history and try to understand their origin and the disgusting tradition that was practiced in Westeros before Aegon conquered it. Some may tell you that dragon seeds are simply bastards with Valerian blood, but there's much more to the story than that. So in this video, we will explore the real history behind dragon seeds, which goes back to the age of the first men. Next, we'll dive into the evolution of dragon seeds in Westeros before exploring the super significant role they played in the Dance of Dragons. Let's begin. But before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Aegon I and his role in allowing bastardry. When Aegon the Conqueror rode Valerian, the Black Dread, to take over Westeros and its multiple kingdoms, he found himself unfamiliar with the culture and tradition of the people he was going to rule. Needless to say, a good king should know the people he wants to rule. So Aegon set on a journey throughout the six kingdoms he had acquired with six different maesters who would answer his questions on the history, local law, and customs. On his journey, Aegon learned that each of these kingdoms had customs and traditions that were specific to that kingdom, and he was basically an outsider, a ruler, sure, but an outsider too. So, unlike the colonists who brought the white man's burden upon themselves, Aegon decided not to interfere with any of the local customs. Naturally, the lords and the common folk were allowed to continue the way they had been, albeit they now had to pledge their fealty to Aegon. Speaking of culture, tradition, and customs, each society has its own nuances when it comes to these things. A few customs might be great, the others, mm, not so much. And just because a particular way of life is socially accepted, it doesn't mean that the way is the right way. One such evil tradition in a few parts of Westeros was the rite of the first night that the High Lords enjoyed, a disgustingly evil practice by virtue of which the High Lords often preyed on the daughters and wives of the fishers of the sea and the tillers of the land. According to this rite, the Lords and their armed men would come down to weddings from their high castles and take away the brides right after they had said holy vows before the gods. Gods. The lords would then enjoy the young brides and return the brides to their husbands the next morning. Very obviously, the young girl would oftentimes be discarded and rebuked by her husband upon her return. Most of the time, this would go on forever. To make it worse for the woman, the lords who would take her would be far from knights in shining armor, but old fat men, some of whom were droolers and rapists, they would be covered in boils and scabs, and some of these high lords failed to shower in six months, with lice in their hair and a stench so disgusting that it could probably drive dragons away. But the right to the first night was something they had come to regard as an unceasable custom. Interestingly, bastards born out of these forced unions were looked down upon throughout their lives by their father and society, and yet there were others who were celebrated and almost respected. These later bastards were called the Dragon Seeds. We'll get into that in a bit, but before that, let's find out how exactly the custom started in Westeros. The Origin of Rite of the First Night and Dragon Seeds in Westeros The concept of the Rite to First Night, or Ju Prime Noctis, in Westeros dates back to the ninth year of Aegon the Conqueror's rule. Aegon granted the ruined castle of Harrenhal to Sir Quentin Quaharis, his former master of arms. When Quentin died, his grandson Gargan, known as Gargan the Guest, inherited the castle and became infamous for attending weddings in his domain to claim the first night with brides. However, this custom actually predates the Andals, stretching back thousands of years to the time of the First Men. Lord Albin Massey, King J. Harris's Justicier, argued that the custom was a symbol of strength and honor among the First Men. The warlords were seen as mighty heroes, and when they blessed a maid with their seed, it was considered an honor. The children born from this union were believed to be stronger and better. Husbands felt privileged to raise these children, but over time, this practice degraded into a curse. Those who were far from heroic, and they were now exploited the custom. Interestingly, Grand Maester Benefer claimed that the Andals did not practice this tradition in Andalus, their original homeland. Anyway, the practice continued until the time of Queen Alysanne and King Jaehaerys. During a trip to the north, Alysanne learned of the horrors of this custom firsthand from a victim in a brothel. Deeply disturbed by what she had heard from the poor girl, Queen Alysanne brought the issue before the king and his council. Grand Maester Benefer seconded what she had to say and agreed that the custom was an evil that needed to be eradicated 
initiated at the first instant. He said, and I quote, Our knights swear to protect the innocence of maidens. We swear our marriage vows before the father and the mother, promising fidelity until the stranger comes to part us. The queen also argued that the custom was a grave injustice to the realm. Now, it all came down to the king, who acknowledged the evil nature of the practice, but was aware of the potential backlash from the lords. He tells the queen that even Oris Baratheon, the founder of House Baratheon, was a dragon seed, born out of wedlock to Lord Arion, father of Aegon I. About dragon seeds, the king said, Dragon seeds, they call them. It is not a thing to boast of, but it has happened, mayhaps more often than we would care to admit. This showed the deep-rooted connection between the houses Baratheon and Targaryen. If you think about it, Targaryen blood has always sat on the Iron Throne, given that Robert was a descendant of Arion. Anyway, despite knowing the challenges, Harris ultimately sided with his wife and abolished the right of first night. However, the custom didn't die out completely. It persisted subtly and even influenced the Targaryens, so much so that it played quite a significant role in the events leading up to the Dance of Dragons. Let's find out how. The Sowing of the Dragon Seeds When Targaryens weren't busy fighting each other, they were often, well, getting busy with each other. But with that fiery Valerian blood coursing through their veins, their own wives often weren't enough to cool them down. These dragon lords would frequently descend from their lofty castles to mingle and mate with the daughters and wives of the small folk. While the custom of the first night had mostly faded away, Dragonstone was a different beast. On Dragonstone, dragon riders were seen almost like gods, so brides felt downright blessed when a Targaryen prince or lord graced them with his attention. Children born from these unions, called dragon seeds, were considered special. Their Targaryen fathers would often lavish them and their mothers with gifts and land. Over time, Dragonstone was swarming with these dragon seeds and their offspring. As the war between Rhaenyra's forces and her half-brother Aegon raged in its full swing, things were looking a bit dicey in the dragon department for the Greens. Sunfire, Aegon's dragon, was left licking its wounds near Rook's Rest, while Prince Daeron's dragon, Tessarion, was in Old Town. This meant King's Landing had only two dragons on standby, Aemon Targaryen's fearsome Vagar and Queen Helena's Dreamfire. But Helena was too heartbroken over her child's loss to be of any threat. Meanwhile, Prince Jaceris, the son of Rhaenyra and Laenor Valerian, was itching to storm King's Landing, as he knew that Vagar was the only real obstacle. He figured that if he attacked with his dragon Vermax, his mother's Cyrax, and his uncle's Caraxes, they might just stand a chance against Vagar. But then there were six riderless dragons at Dragonstone, where Camp Black was presently based. Three of these dragons were wild and had never been tamed, and the other three were without riders due to the war. Jaceris noted that they didn't have enough dragon riders left to tame the likes of Grey Ghost or Sea Smoke, but Mushroom, the jester of Rhaenyra's court, suggested Jaceris look for potential dragon riders among the Targaryen bastards. Under the sheets and in the woodpiles, wherever you Targaryens spilled your silver seed, he quipped. Well, at least he claims that he suggested it to Jaceris, and although we would not know the truth, it's a fact that Jaceris started looking for more dragon riders amongst the common folk. In a nutshell, this was a move to bolster their ranks with so-called dragon seeds, those of Targaryen blood, but not of legitimate birth. It was a risky gamble, but one that could potentially tip the scales in favor of Rhaenyra's side in the ongoing struggle for the Iron Throne. However, none of these illegitimate children really knew how to ride a dragon. That's when Prince Jaceris announced that anyone who could tame a dragon would be rewarded with riches, lands, and a knighthood. Their sons would become lords, and their daughters would be married off to other lords. And of course, the new dragon riders would get the honor of fighting beside the Prince of Dragonstone against Aegon II. Needless to say, many of the dragon seeds tried their hands at taming the riderless dragons, be it the untamed ones like Sheepstealer or the tamed ones like Vermithor and Sea Smoke. What came next? In what can only be described as a fiery chaos of the Dance of Dragons, the Dragon Seeds played a pivotal role, sure, but they also flipped the course of the war and turned the tide of the battle on multiple occasions. In the end, three brave souls managed to tame Sea Smoke, Vermithor, and Silverwing, all of which had been previously ridden and were somewhat more welcoming than the three wild dragons lurking around Dragonstone. Ulf the White, a rugged man at arms, claimed Silverwing, the former dragon of Queen Alysanne Targaryen. This was a 
beast who had flown to the wall as well, which is not something that most dragons can say about themselves. Then there was the colossal Hugh the Hammer, who managed to mount Vermithor, King J. Harris's beast. Vermithor was the second largest dragon right after Vagar, but perhaps the most intriguing story is that of Adam of Hull, who became Sea Smoke's new rider. Adam was the son of Marilda, a shipwright's daughter, and he had a younger brother named Alan. Both boys had the telltale white hair that marked them as Targaryen bastard, but Marilda had kept the identity of their father a secret until Prince Joceris called for new dragon rider. Marilda claimed that Laenor Valerian was their father, but everyone knew Laenor's preference for men, which made this claim dubious at best. Mushroom believed that it was actually Corlys Valerian, the sea snake, who fathered them. Corlys, who had lost his legitimate son, took a keen interest in Adam and Alan, and even presented them to Prince Joceris in the hope of getting them legitimized. Corliss's push led Adam being declared Adam Valerian, heir to Driftmark, but the red sowing didn't end there. It brought more bloodshed and tragedy to the Seven Kingdoms. The wild dragons posed their own challenges. No one dared approach the fearsome cannibal, and those who did never lived to tell the tale. Grey Ghost remained elusive until he was eventually slain by Sunfire, who had flown from Rook's Rest to Dragonmont. Yet, amidst this turmoil and the bloodshed, a young girl named Nettles, just 16 years old, managed managed to tame the wild dragon Sheep Stealer. How she did it is another fascinating story, which I will cover later in the video. So anyway, with four new dragon riders in his ranks, Joceris seemed to have achieved his goal. Having said that, this victory came at a great cost. The attempt to tame the dragons led to numerous deaths and unimaginable suffering. Those who survived the dragon fire often found themselves in a state worse than death, bearing the scars of a war that tore the realm apart. But what was the fate of these dragon riders? How exactly did they influence the war? Who lived and who perished? Let's find out. 1. Nettles Maester Munkin introduces us to Nettles, whose name might remind us of a stinging plant. This is fitting, considering there's a theory suggesting Nettles had a connection with the forest. We'll circle back to that later. Mushroom describes her as a small brown girl of 16 with black hair, brown eyes, brown skin, and a skinny frame. In the book, the Valerians and Targaryens are all fair-skinned, including their bastards. However, the show's casting of black actors for the Valerians was done in order to avoid viewing viewer confusion. But Nettle's brown skin in the book tells us something about her mother. She was reportedly a dockside prostitute who likely abandoned Nettle's early on and left the young girl to fend for herself. This upbringing made Nettle's fearless and foul mouth. Growing up without a mother, money, or support, she survived by stealing and engaging in the flesh trade in Spicetown and Hall. Girls in her position often traded their innocence for a crust of bread or a few coins, sometimes even before their first flowering. Despite her rough start, Nettles was fierce, and I believe loyal to Rhaenyra. But how did this young prostitute manage to claim a wild dragon when so many trained knights and lords of Dragonstone couldn't? Nettles' method was unique and simple. She tamed Sheep Stealer by feeding him a freshly slaughtered sheep each morning until he became accustomed to her present. This patience and cunning allowed her to bond with the dragon in a way that the others couldn't. Nettles proved her worth in the Battle of the Gullet, where she fought for Queen Rhaenyra Targaryen, while others celebrated, she was tearful because of Prince Jocerys' death and the destruction of her home Spice Town. Later, she landed her dragon on Vicinia's Hill during the fall of King's Landing. But of course, her adventures didn't end there. Nettles joined Prince Daemon Targaryen to hunt down Prince Aemond and his dragon Vagar along the Trident. They stayed at House Mouton's castle in Maidenpool, from where they searched every morning for Vagar and Aemond. Because the two spent so much time together, rumors flew about their relationship. Mushroom says that Daemon had fallen for Nettles and taken her as a lover. Gildane found this story more credible than most because they slept in adjoining rooms, dined together, and Daemon showered her with gifts every now and then. On the other hand, Maester Norn's Chronicles of Maidenpool adds to all of this. He says that Daemon taught Nettles proper courtesies, how to wash herself properly, and they often shared a tub, washing each other. Some like to believe that he was more than a father figure than a lover, but how many fathers bathed their 16 to 17 year old daughters? And if they do, there is something seriously wrong with them. Anyway, Lady Mazaria, Daemon's former lover, added more fuel to the fire growing in Rhaenyra's heart. In fact, Mazaria stoked Rhaenyra's distrust 
most of the dragon seeds by spreading rumors about Nettles and Daemon's relationship. Rhaenyra became convinced that Nettles had bewitched Sheepstealer and seduced Daemon, and such acts had only one punishment in the eyes of Rhaenyra, death. She sent a raven to Lord Manfred Mouton of Maidenpool and instructed him to kill Nettles but to spare Daemon, so that he could be returned to King's Landing. However, Lord Mouton and his advisors feared Daemon's wrath, but more importantly, they were unwilling to kill a guest. Naturally, they decided to ignore the Queen's order, and Maester Norn advises Lord Mouton to act as though they had never received the message from Rhaenyra. When Maester Norn informed Daemon of Rhaenyra's command, Daemon could clearly see Mazaria's manipulation in Rhaenyra's words. He thanked Norn for the warning and arranged for Nettles to escape. The next morning, Daemon helped Nettles saddle Sheepstealer one last time. After feeding her dragon a large black ram, Nettles tearfully flew into the mists of the Bay of Crabs. It's said that as Nettles departed on Sheepstealer, Caraxes, Daemon's dragon, let out a scream that shattered all the windows of Jonquil's tower. Daemon did not return to King's Landing, but instead headed for Harrenhal, where he met his end fighting Amond in the battle above the god's eye. Now because his body was never found, some songs suggest he survived and reunited with Nettle, but it couldn't be further from the truth. On the other hand, Rhaenyra was furious over Nettle's escape and her husband's betrayal. When King Aegon II reclaimed the Iron Throne after Rhaenyra's death, there were reports of Sheepstealer being seen around Crackclaw Point and the Mountains of the Moon. In 134 AC, during King Aegon III's reign, Sir Robert Rowan led a royal army to the Vale of Arryn. They encountered Nettles and Sheepstealer in a cave, which resulted in the deaths of 16 men and many more wounded. Nettles and her dragon fled into the Mountains of the Moon and were never seen again in Westeros. However, the mountain clans of the Vale tell tales of a fire witch who lived in a hidden valley with her dragon. 2. Hugh Hammer and Ulf the White Hugh Hammer's origins are rather mysterious, mostly because GRRM had no reason to build him a good backstory. Anyway, he somehow managed to claim Vermithor, the colossal beast that once belonged to King Jaehaerys. Vermithor was the second largest dragon in the world, right after Queen Visenya's Vagar. In the series, we see Daemon singing to Vermithor, perhaps trying to reawaken the dragon's connection to humans after decades without a rider. If things had gone differently, Vermithor might have even surpassed Vagar in size because Vermithor was a much younger dragon than Vagar. Now, why Vermithor chose Hugh Hammer is again a mystery. There's a theory floating around that Hugh might have had some link to the old King Jaehaerys. Kind of like how Adam of Hull managed to bond with Sea Smoke, despite the official claim that Adam was Laenor Valerian's son. A bit dubious, I know, but he still had some connection with House Valerian, even if it was through Corlys. When Hugh Hammer joined Rhaenyra's side, the Blacks half the battle had been won. But soon, the tides of war demanded action. After Prince Lucerys Valerian's death, his brother Jaehaerys was desperate to protect his sibling and sought to send Princess Viserys and Aegon to, to Pentos for their safety. However, the Triarchy ambushed them and captured Prince Viserys, and in the aftermath, Jaehaerys was also killed. Despite the chaos, Hugh Hammer and his fellow dragon seed Ulf White celebrated their so-called victory with whining and dining. After Rhaenyra took King's Landing, Hugh Hammer followed, and even his arrival was filled with violence as he killed one of the Queen's knights over a dispute in a brothel. Despite this, he was knighted and given land. It wasn't before long that Hugh and Ulf White were sent to defend Tumbleton against the Hightower forces. However, they betrayed Rhaenyra and joined the Greens, which was the first major defection that Camp Black had to face. So why did they switch sides? Well, it's Game of Thrones. Betrayal runs in the blood, and power shifts like the wind. You either win or you die and sometimes, switching sides is sometimes the best chance for survival. Tumbleton was a quaint market town that nestled on the banks of the River Mander. House Footley's seat, though lightly guarded, swelled with thousands of reinforcements from the south and the Riverlands. The Black Faction was riding high on their recent victory, and with the arrival of Ulf White and Hugh Hammer on their dragons, it seemed like the deal was sealed. After all, Silverwing and Vermithor were powerful old beasts. But as I mentioned, the tides of war are ever treacherous. Soon the high towers entered the scene, and although they were trembling in the shadow of these mighty dragons, they knew how to play politics, how to buy people, and most importantly, how to break the blacks. They sent defectors to infiltrate the black camp. Among them are Lord Owen Borney and Sir Roger Corn, who managed to sway Hugh Hammer and Ulf White to their side. Hugh Hammer, despite his build, physique, and the power of Vermithor, had never faced a real battle. The sight of the Hightower army's spear points glittering in the sun filled him with dread. 
Tessarian, though smaller, seemed like a serious challenge to Hugh, and Hugh Hammer wasn't ready to face Tessarion. But fear wasn't the only motivator. Hugh Hammer was driven by greed. He craved more than just the knighthood he received from Rhaenyra. He desired land, titles, and power. Despite being knighted and given land, he wasn't satisfied. When Daemon had suggested rewarding Hugh and Ulf with the castles of the executed lords Stockworth and Roseby, Rhaenyra vetoed the idea. This slight got coupled with promises of greater rewards from King Aegon, and Hugh decided it was time to bleed green. Silverwing and Vermithor turned against Rhaenyra's forces. Tumbleton became a hell, engulfed in dragonfire. Homes, shops, seps, and people were incinerated without any regard. The roar of dragons and the screams of burning men, women, and children filled the air. In a matter of moments, Rhaenyra lost not just a strategic stronghold, but two powerful dragons and a significant portion of her army. The betrayal at Tumbleton was a devastating blow, which changed the course of the war and the future of House Targaryen. However, the cheers of the Greens quickly turned to despair when news of Aemon's death reached them. Yep, he had been slain near Harrenhal by Daemon and his dragon Caraxi. This news left Hugh Hammer as the rider of the largest living dragon, Vermithor. Hugh felt invincible, for dragons were the nukes of Westeros, and now he had the biggest one. Hugh started to believe he was worthy of the Iron Throne, and told this to Prince Daeron Targaryen, who was justifiably enraged. When asked what right he had to claim the throne, Hugh replied that his dragon gave him the same right that Aegon the Conqueror had. Quite obviously, the highborn knights and lords couldn't stomach the idea of a bastard on the Iron Throne. A secret meeting was called to discuss how to deal with Hugh Hammer and Ulf White. Ulf, often drunk and lacking military prowess, would be easy to kill. But Hugh was a different story altogether. He was protected by loyal men eager to earn his favor, so he was not easily reachable. Still, a plan was hatched to eliminate him, and just as it was about to be executed, Adam Valerian arrived with his dragon Sea Smoke. Hugh Hammer rushed to reach Vermithor, but before he could mount his dragon, Sir John Roxton struck him down with his Valerian steel sword, Orphan Maker. And so ended Hugh Hammer. As for Ulf White, he was poisoned by Sir Hobart Hightower. 3. Adam Valerian I've already spoken much about who Adam was and how he got to ride sea smoke, so I won't be repeating it here. Anyway, after the betrayal by the two betrayers at the First Battle of Tumbleton, the Black Council was in turmoil. Suspicion fell on all dragon seeds, and even Adam Valerian's loyalty was questioned. Despite Lord Corlys Valerian's impassioned defense, proclaiming Adam and Alan as true Valerians, Queen Rhaenyra was not convinced. She ordered Sir Luthor Largent to arrest Adam in the dragon pit, but Adam Adam had been warned about this already and managed to escape on sea smoke. Once again, Rhaenyra found herself losing a dragon, but this time around, she also lost her hand of the queen. Corlys was beaten and imprisoned for his loyalty to Adam, but Adam was determined to prove that not all bastards were traitors, so he flew from King's Landing to the God's Eye and sought counsel with the Green Men. Who are they? Well, when the First Men came to Westeros, they, they found themselves in conflict with the Children of the Forest, but this bloodshed went for far too long and it was finally decided by the elders of both the warring factions that they needed peace. In its aftermath, green men were created to protect the weirwood trees on the Isle of Faces and the Isle itself. Anyway, after meeting the green men, Adam railed an army of loyalists from castles great and small. By the time he was ready to strike Tumbleton, he had nearly 4,000 men behind him. Adam attacked Tumbleton at night, and as expected, he caught the greens off guard. Amidst the chaos, Adam saw the dragons Vermithor, Silverwing, and Tessarion wreaking havoc. Tessarion was now riderless and in raid. As Tessarion took flight, Adam on sea smoke met her in the sky. The two young dragons fought fiercely, and the battle turned into a chaotic rout, especially when the riderless Vermithor rose into the sky, indiscriminately killing those on the ground below. As Vermithor went on a rampage, Adam Valerian and Sea Smoke fought him as well. According to Archmaester Gildane, Adam felt a duty to protect his men. Although he knew deep down that Sea Smoke couldn't match the might of the older dragon, Adam kept on going. The battle intensified as the riderless Tessarian joined and the three dragons fought amidst mud, blood, and smoke. In the aftermath, Lord Unwin Peak accepted defeat and ordered a retreat to Old Town. Adam, once accused of treachery, had saved King's Landing from Rhaenyra's enemies, but he sacrificed his life in the process. I am indebted to you, Alan. 4. 
Alan Valerian. After the treachery of the two betrayers, King Aegon II fed Rhaenyra to his dragon, Sunfire, during the fall of Dragonstone. But Alan Valerian, just 15 years old, commanded the Valerian fleet to prevent the king from returning to King's Landing. Alan's ships were Aegon's only defense at the Gullet, and he held strong against Bravosi ships carrying Valemen towards the capital, as well as armies of rivermen and northmen marching against the king. Despite Corlys Valerian's advice to abdicate, Aegon II was soon found dead from poison. After a brief siege, the servants of Dragonstone overwhelmed Aegon II's men and surrendered the castle to Alan. During the Hour of the Wolf, Lord Cragen Stark, who briefly served as Hand of the King, was convinced by Alysanne Blackwood to spare Corliss's life, because she feared it might provoke Alan and the Valerian fleet. Alan attended the coronation of Aegon Targaryen III and the new king's wedding to Jaehera Targaryen. When Lord Corliss Valerian passed in 132 AC, Alan became Lord of the Tides. Alan and his mother, Marilda of Hull, transported Corliss's body to Driftmark and buried him at sea aboard Sea Snake. Although Daemon and Daeron Valerian advanced their own claims to Driftmark, the brothers reconciled with Alan after Aegon's regent ruled against them. Sir Malentine and Sir Rogar Valerian, two of the Silent Five, attempted to assassinate Alan at Castle Driftmark. Malentine was killed in the attempt, and Rogar chose to take the Black. As Corliss's heir, Alan attempted to join the regents, but Sir Tyland Lannister, Hand of the King, rejected him for his youth and selected Lord Unwin Peak instead. Later, in 132 AC, the regents attempted to marry off Aegon's heir, Lady Bela Targaryen, to keep her under their control. Bela escaped the Red Key and fled to Driftmark because she wanted Alan. They were married in the Sept at Dragonstone a fortnight later. Although some regents wished to appeal to the High Sept for an annulment, the Hand publicized that the marriage had been arranged by the king and court. After the death of Sir Tyland Lannister in 133 AC, King Aegon III named Alan Valerian as his Lord Admiral. But Lord Unwin Peak, against the king's wishes, managed to secure the position of Hand of the King for himself. Sometime later, the Narrow Sea found itself in chaos due to the Daughters' War, and Unwin wanted a Westerosi presence on Bloodstone. Instead of sending Lord Allen, Unwin appointed his inexperienced uncle, Sir Gedmund Peak, to command the royal fleet and ordered Allen to assist Gedmund. Allen's assault on the Bravosi in the Stepstones earned him immense fame and the title Oakenfist, along with Hero of the Stepstone. Despite Lord Peak's protest, Alan was knighted by Sir Marston Waters, the Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, and was named Master of Ships by the King. Unwin hoped Alan would perish when sent to deal with Dalton Greyjoy, the Red Kraken, but this mission instead became the first of Alan's six great voyages. Aboard Lady Bela, Alan ventured to Bloodstone, where he encountered the pirate king called Rakalio Rindoon. Their relationship swung between friendship and enmity and Alan's voyage continued to Sunspear, where he gained the favor of Princess Aleandra Martell and Old Town, where he befriended Lord Lionel Hightower and Samantha Tarly, visited the Citadel, and received a blessing from the High Septon at the Starry Sept. In the Westerlands, Alan found Dalt Greyjoy already assassinated. Lady Joanna Lannister rewarded him with a golden seahorse, and he left a portion of his fleet to help protect the Westermen. On his return journey, Alan learned that Prince Viserys Targaryen was held captive by House Rogare of Lys. He sailed to Lys and negotiated the prince's release for a hefty ransom of 100,000 golden dragons. Upon his return to King's Landing in 134 AC, Bela Targaryen presented Alan with their daughter, Lena. Despite Lord Peak's disapproval of the ransom amount, Alan was widely praised for rescuing Prince Viserys. This achievement led to Lord Thaddeus Rowan replacing Unwin as Hand of the King, and Alan returned to Driftmark with his young family, his reputation solidified as a hero and a skilled admiral. After Lady Jane Arryn's death, the Iron Throne threw its weight behind her chosen heir, Sir Joffrey Arryn, against the competing claims of Sir Arnold and Isambard Arryn. The rebellion in the Vale of Arryn escalated after Sir Corwin Corbray was killed at Runestone. To crush the uprising, Lord Thaddeus Rowan sent two armies, while Sir Robert Rowan took the high road, and our man Alan Valerian transported Moreto Rogueras' forces by sea. Alan's fleet clashed with Isambard's cell sails at Galltown and secured victory, but lost hundreds of loyalists in the process. In his later years, Alan helped King Daeron Targaryen I in his conquest of Dorne as master of ships. He commanded a fleet that broke the Planky Town and swept up the Greenblood River while Daeron engaged the main 
Dornish forces in the prince's path. Alan returned to subdue Planky Town and the Greenblood in 160 AC, after the Dornish rebelled, but the young dragon Daeron was slain the following year under a peace ban, which led to King Baylor I making peace with the Dornish. Unfortunately, Alan disappeared at sea around 175 AC. A year later, Lena, who had hoped to marry him, agreed to wed another, and with that ended the legendary saga of Oakenfist. Hi, Silver Dennis. Silver Dennis had silver hair and purple eyes, and certainly looked like he had Valerian blood running through his veins. He claimed to be a descendant of the infamous King Magor Targaryen I, though many doubted Magor, despite his numerous marriages, was notoriously unable to produce a living heir. So it's likely Dennis Valerian's blood came from another source. That is, if at all he was a Valerian. When Prince Joceris Valerian called for dragon riders, Dennis tried to mount the wild dragon Sheep Stealer. Unfortunately, it did not go well for him as Sheep Stealer ripped off his arm. While his sons tried to stop the bleeding, the cannibal swooped down and devoured Dennis and his son. There's a theory floating around that Dennis might be related to a red-headed man-at-arms who claimed to be Magor the Cruel's natural son during the Great Council of 101 AC. However, this seems unlikely given the differences in their appearances and the specifics of their claim. So that was all about Dragon Seed. I hope you didn't miss out on anything. We'll be doing a lot more on House of the Dragon as it approaches. So if you like the show and want to know more fascinating stuff around it and about it, do stick around. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one. Be safe. Thanks, everyone.